we get back to the lectures, let me say a few words about the homework. So, um, um, I managed to forget in the intervening years that there was a um, glitch in homework, homework one, problem four, had, even, even the approximation that I was telling you, it had an unintended diagram, which I hope none of you came across. scalars to two fermions, pi phi, yep. psi psi, or psi bar psi. Um, and there was this diagram. And the reason I gave you that large n approximation was to avoid any kind of loop diagram that wasn't the loop diagram that we did um, and, and, and then were normalized. So this one, however, is there and it is a loop diagram that we haven't done. It's not hard, but haven't done it, and we haven't talked about it, and I'm saving all the loop, all the loops that we haven't done, the infinity minus one of them, for once we get these formal methods up our sleeve, okay, so that we can tackle any diagram, talk about, even talk about it, uh, to make assertions. Yeah. So, um, so there's a symmetry, we can change the theory to get rid of this, so, so in fact, that, that, motivates um, problem question two of homework, oh, sorry, question one of homework uh, two. And, um, and basically there's a slight tweak of the problem so that instead of having this Yukawa coupling, you have this Yukawa coupling. And as the question explains, there is a symmetry that the theory still has under which phi is a pseudoscalar and it's coupling to a pseudoscalar bilinear of fermion. So the whole thing is actually parity symmetric, um, but with a non-trivial symmetry parity acting on phi. Phi is odd under parity. And that actually ends up, with that coupling, you end up actually killing this diagram. And that's the end of it. So, in homework two, the first couple of pieces of homework two, of, of question one, the first couple of pieces of question one of homework two, is just to quickly, I'm not trying to get you to write it out for you, I'm just trying to tell you, please race through and just check that everything you did in homework one, uh, on uh, especially question four, um, would now go through except that you would not have to worry about this diagram, okay? But then, then starts the real questions. I mean, I think the last two or three pieces of question one of homework two uh, are really new material. I mean, it's not new. You should hopefully you just review what you've learned in class and go through it. But basically what it's trying to do is to tell you um, when we pose problems in class or in a, in, a, in a question, in a typical problem, we say, here is the Lagrangian, here is the coupling constants, and now go and calculate some physical process. Whereas in the real world, you only get told one experiment tells you some physical information, and then you're asked to predict the next experiment. So this idea of correlating different experiments is actually the way science is done. And so it just that quest, the remainder of that question is just to sort of put you on that foot to say, you know, use one experiment to extract some information and then use it to predict the other, all while not running into any infinites. Okay, so that is uh, explaining the source of that first question of homework two, and in particular, 
the sense in which it is partly just going back to Homer 1 a little bit, fixing up this glitch. Um, now, there is uh, the so, so there's also, Samu and I have been talking about the second problem in Homer 2, which is about wick rotations. And um, I might rewrite that. I might rewrite it because so basically there I show you how to do wick rotation. I mean I show you where the wick rotation of the uh, one loop integral is coming from in the most optimal case where nothing stops you in a contour integral from rotating the real axis for energy to the imaginary axis for energy and making everything look like four-dimensional Euclidean space. Um, however, it is possible that even in cases where the direct attack fails, you can still turn it into a Euclidean integral. Um, so maybe I will just write that problem instead. So don't start. Can I ask a quick question about it? Yeah, so don't we'll start uh, homework two. Question two. Yeah. Yeah. What was the diagram that we were supposed to draw in homework four? <laughs> supposed to look like? Um, <laughs> so I think there's like. Uh, There's this, but, but of course these are external states, so they they have the um, you know so there's rest propagators sitting here, and hence there's oh so you just wanted that yeah okay <laughs> just each of these problems is chosen to do only like one very small thing. Of course, in the end, the real problem you do all of these things with all the subtleties. But, um. Okay, back to the action. Um, so, where were we? Yeah, so I. We had gotten. Just changed variables this p tilde so that the p tilde the, p, the momentum integral had no x dependent pieces at all. It was a totally disentangled from so so it looked like this. Okay, so we had pushed the path and roll, this expression here, into uh, this form. And uh, so what I was saying was, well, so first of all, I was saying this is just a constant. And it's an irrelevant, so it's an irrelevant constant. So just from the pure quantum mechanics viewpoint, Suppose I was not warming up to do quantum field theory. I am just interested in honestly doing quantum mechanics. In what sense is this irrelevant? Well, it's irrelevant because 
the questions you're asking <coughs> are about going from xi to xf. And that stipulation of xi and xf is sitting in this factor here. There is no xi, xf dependence to this factor. So if you want the amplitude to go to xi to xf, don't bother looking here. So, so in that sense, it's just an overall factor. If you think of this as some sort of wave function, this is just some trivial, bad normalization of the wave function. Okay. We're always willing to work with any wave function and normalize it later or somewhere else. Down this, down this so in that sense, this is trivial. Um, it's a funny kind of integral because you should, again, I said, please think of this as a product of... Uh, product of integrals, one for every t. And you can think of it as discretized time if you feel like. Say there was no honest way I actually wrote down a continuous multiple integral, but it's at least some discrete thing. And in fact, if I have a final time, an initial time and a final time, the number of times, if I, if I discretize the time step, then the number of times is fixed. So this is a finite multiple integral for discretized time. But even then, it would take this form. So even in the discretized version, I said follow along in the discretized way if it makes you more comfortable. Um, this factor still came out. Okay, still it's not. Uh, it was not. Um, now, what was the other thing? Um, the nature of, is this actually a, so even take one of these integrals, right? Um, you think of the integral as a sum of many terms that look like this. then this is like the exponential. It's like the product of exponentials of this form. And that's why you're summing the exponents. Okay? But the only, we're OK. Again, you can think of this as delta t if you want. But uh, notice that it's at least, is, is it finite? Well, it's sort of a weird thing in the sense that at best, it's finite when you go to infinity in the sense that there's some sort of wild phase <coughs> cancellation. Um, later, we'll see that for our field theory purposes, this will be, this will look slightly different. And we won't have to rely on the wild phase. Okay, so right now, it, we say it looks like it makes sense mathematically. But in any case, it's an irrelevant constant. So this part, I'm not going to worry about further. We'll come back and just take a second look at this later. Um, and of course, this is just a, it's a classical action, integral dt prime of x dot squared over 2m and x dot squared minus. Um, so, I've said it before, but I'm saying it again as the exercise show this remains the form. function of x, which is a function of t, but it also has some explicit time dependence. Okay. So there's a 
quantum theory, you'd say this is the x hat operator. And then it might have some explicit time dependence. So show that this, that you can go through the same rigmarole, the same set of steps of breaking up into small time steps, and so on and so on, and turning it into a path integral. Um, same path integral form, but with this classical potential. So here it's a quantum potential, because it's a function of a quantum operator x hat here. Here, it's the classical action. This is the classical potential. The x that you see there is just a C number. It's a C function, okay, which is x is a function of time. In that sense, the potential is ultimately a function of time. It's p prime. But, but it's also explicitly a function of p. Okay. So that's the only amendment that we're making in this whole path of and this is actually the version that I want. I mean, I want time-dependent potentials for where we're going. Um, but I couldn't be bothered to write it out so much. So you do it. I think you have all the steps now, so it's a reasonable exercise. Um, OK. Uh, but, but we are sort of left hanging with the kind of question, how formal is this expression? where we have an infinite number of multiple integrals to do, and it's a continuous infinity as the time step goes to 0. And the same is true here. <clears throat> this really means product over times integral of an x for every value of time I have to do such an integral. So can we make sense of it? Um, and when can we pass between this sort of continuous path integral language and the multiple discretized integrals that we get um, before taking the time step to zero. So leave that question hanging. Formally, this is it. Um, now, let's uh, generalize at least these steps. Generalize to uh, n dimensions. non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Okay. So the statement is just put put a vector on everything here. drop this proportionality constant. Because we are not afraid of it anymore. Just keep this term. And um, so we write like this. Here, I should just say, even this action, the action, no, the action is the action. So. Okay, so there it is. Uh, again, you just put the classical action. And uh, that was easy, but that's because we're only passing quickly through the n dimensional case en route to quantum field theory. Okay, so now we want to go to scalar quantum field theory, relativistic. In other words, the final target, the subject of this course. 
So here, h is equal to Quantum operators are only dependent on x, but this source can depend on t explicitly, and it can even depend on x explicitly. So there, there is now explicit dependence on both x and t here, in general, okay, to be able to deal with this kind of situation. Okay. And um, now we are making an analogy. just to see that everything is just going for the ride in analogy with n-dimensional quantum mechanics. The analogy is this, that um, the dynamical variable the dynamical variable of here is clearly x as a vector, so it's in n dimensions. So there are n components of x. Whereas the dynamical variable here is going to be, um, well, of course, it's phase space if you want. If you, if you want to start in this language here. Before I get here, I start here. And there's the configuration space variable, which is x. And here, the configuration space variable is, is this. And here, there is also a pi conjugate momentum, and here there's also a conjugate field momentum. Um, there is the index i, and the analogy is x itself. i tells me which x I'm talking about. Here, x tells me which phi I'm talking about. Phi is the quantum operator. The x, the x is the quantum operator. The phi is the quantum operator. But there are many quantum operators. There are n of them. Here, there is a continuous infinity x of them. If you want, imagine a spatial lattice in a finite room. Then the number of points x is finite. N. That's this n. Okay, but that's the analogy I made. And uh, then uh, there's the quantum mechanical potential, which is a function of the x vector. And um, t. And, uh, and here, it's our quantum field theory potential, which is a function of phi. very analogous, of course. The xi is like the phi's x. The t is like the t. Even this x, which seems like it's extra, it's just not part of the language of big quantum mechanics. 
For example, suppose I want to write some electric field in the x2 direction, right? Then I could have, as an example, d quantum mechanics equals some constant k times x2 hat. Look, my quantum mechanics potential depends on that index 2. Well, that's what that's this that's this x here. It's just saying that we don't bother to tell ourselves that when you write a quantum mechanics potential, especially if it's not rotationally invariant, that you might ex have an explicit index that shows up in the potential. We're used to it in non rotational quantum mechanics. It could be there. And similarly here, okay, this could have an explicit dependence on x. There it is, there's an example. Okay, so this analogy is very close. Um, who else needs to be analogized? Oh, yeah, so crucially, time and time. Time is totally canonically treated in this sense. The analogy of time is not something else, it's just time itself. Okay. So if you look at this and the potential, I can imagine the potential here, you see that, um, oh, sorry, crucial. This is part of this analog potential. Okay. Again, imagine that you just discretize space. Then this would just be some sort of, um, sorry. Thank you. Does that make it worse? For you? No, that helps. Oh. Um, so, so, well, let me just point. The gradient term here, why is it a potential in the sense that this is a potential? Well, again, if you just think of x as the index, and you just imagine even a discretized version of a, of a gradient, that would be something like phi at x, if you think of it as an index, plus, say, 3 times the unit vector in the i direction, or the x1 direction. Um, plus, plus i. Minus minus phi at x. So this is like, an, like if I would divide by the lattice spacing, this would be an approximate gradient. This would be the analog of the gradient in the i direction. Okay? If I squared it, then it would be like the gradient squared in the i direction. If I summed over up the, the, the unit vector, But, but basically, if you think of this as like an x, and this as like an index, this is the analog of something like writing x3 minus x2. In other words, x sum index minus x at the index next door squared. When you write something like this in the Hamiltonian, non-relativistic quantum mechanics where this is an operator, but, but it's the x operator. This is nothing but another kind of potential. Okay. So this is very definitely a potential term in this analogy. Okay. So with this, every, every term here, if you only discretize for a second the x's, you'll see that the structure of quantum field theory this is so-called second quantization. But the structure of quantum field theory, with this thinking of x as a kind of discrete index, matches perfectly the structure of non-relativistic quantum mechanics with one tiny sort of convention that is set to one, which is that the mass uh, mass. See, this looks like p squared over 2m, pi squared over 2, <coughs> except that the m is 1. Okay? Even this 
integral over x is just saying, you know, when you write something like p squared over 2m, that corresponds to sum over i pi pi over 2m. So you have to take pi of x, pi of x, and sum over x. It's exactly this analogy. So uh, think about it. The, it's an incredibly useful analogy. Um, use it every day. But it can also deceive you because the same object, x, appears in two different parts of the analogy on both sides. So the same x is there. I mean, rather, something called x is here. It's, it is space. In, if you're a non-relativistic quantum mechanic person, this is space. And indeed, if you're a relativistic field theorist, this is space. And they space means space. That's the intention for the experimentalist. And yet, in terms of the mathematical analogy I'm making, they are not the same. The analog of space here is actually the field. It's field space. Field space is the analog of space. Space, on the, C, on the quantum field theory side, is the analog of the direction of space here. So use it, benefit from it, but, the, but don't get confused by it. Often you end up jumping in midstream and thinking in terms of the x and the analogy rather than the x that you were starting out thinking about in the real field. Okay, that's the only warning. Um, but, but because of that, we have a very simple version of the path I wrote. Just by generalizing our n-dimensional quantum mechanics, we know the answer. And so the answer is, first, what's the question? That's always better to know. Um, in fact, the answer is going to be easy enough to read out, but um, we have to talk a little bit about what the question is. Simple. It's just time evolution with the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian itself may be an integral over x, but once you talk about the Hamiltonian, it's the same canonical question, time evolution. And uh, now, um, this is actually just space. In other words, when somebody writes this notation, non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Of course, what they mean is x1, x2, up to xn. But you don't see the 1, 2, n in this notation, because you say, oh, that's the collection of n-tuplets in a compact notation. Here, too, when I write <coughs> phi i, this is terrible, I should just call it initial, otherwise you'll think the i is an index. When I write phi initial like this, if you want, you can think of this bracket as being this arrow. <coughs> it's saying I'm not writing out, but of course what this means is the collection of all these numbers. Phi at x for every value of x. Just like here, we mean of all of these, these n-tuplet numbers, these n numbers, and that's what this is. Okay. So, so far I'm writing everything in perfect analogy. And the answer for this uh, thing is given by a path integral. And the path integral looks like this. So up 
till now, phi has been a quantum operator, but in this path integral, it's become a C number that is being integrated over. And that's phi initial of uh, x and phi x at t final. Classical, classical action. Um, where this means this is space Also, a product over a space one for that separately. So, we just think of this as an index. So, for every time and for every index, I have to do an integral. And this is the analogy for this previously existing. So, just to press the analogy, even when we talked about the n-dimensional case and we wrote the n-dimensional path integral here, where this was time, so that itself was product over time, or product over times, and just ordinary integrals where x is just at that particular time. But it was a vector x, and of course, everybody knows that the integral over volume of in this vector space is just take every component and integrate that as a one-dimensional integral. So I didn't even bother to stress it there, but, but there it is. So this product over x that you're seeing here is nothing but this product over j. Again, that, that dictionary is telling you exactly why you're seeing those two things. But then we can read this another way that we're just doing the product over space-time. You can think of space-time as a lattice. We're doing the product over space-time where the field is just being integrated at that particular place <coughs> and time. And there's one such integral for every point in space-time. Okay? Now, um, so before we ask what the question means, Already we see some things that are very interesting happen. Um, we start with uh, the usual sort of canonical structure of the Hamiltonian, where time is playing this incredibly special role. Time is not present inside any of the Schrodinger operators. Um, we are evolving in time, and that's so special. Space is something completely different. Uh, but, but already we've massaged it into a form where we're starting to see time and space in a pretty democratic, we're hoping for such a thing because relativity seems to allow the exchange of time and space to some extent. Already they are sort of being treated on a similar footing. The field that we are path integrated is a C number, unlike these guys, which are Schrodinger operators is a function of space-time, all of a sudden, on a more democratic footing. And this classical action
that comes from that, that corresponds to that Hamiltonian is nothing but integral over pi, and then integral over, since the Hamiltonian itself is an integral over space, and then, um, so it's the analog, I don't bother to write, but the analog of the non-relativistic action, so let me just write it and explain it, which is, mass term, which is obviously a potential term, it looks just like a harmonic oscillator. So we still have no n equals one, really, right? Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> um, the, the quantum mechanics m, the quantum mechanics m has the analog of one in field theory. The field theory as if somebody is always, if I give you a mass term, you see, it looks like, so basically I'm reminding you that in a harmonic oscillator you have something like omega squared x squared over 2 um, uh, with some m's thrown in. Okay. Now, since m is 1, whether I keep this or I don't doesn't matter, but just pointing out that when you write m squared phi squared, that's like writing omega squared x squared. In a harmonic oscillator. So you can think of this, like if this was lambda phi to the fourth, this whole thing is a grand collection of anharmonic, coupled anharmonic oscillators. Yeah. The setting of m equal to one from quantum mechanics to field theory. Yeah. Is that the same as the square root 2 omega p normalization factor we had in the phi definition? Is that what it is doing? No. No. Um, no, it is not. So it's not a choice of this? It is a choice because it's a choice of what dimension you want to give the field phi. I could choose some other random dimension. You see, we come to quantum mechanics, non-relativistic quantum mechanics, with a pre-existing set of units and conventions. And hence, there is something called, with dimensions called mass. Uh, we come to field theory without any particular preconceived notions of mass and dimension. So if I said, what are the units of phi? And you'd never take the first course in 624 or something. Like that. I have no idea. I have no reason to want one thing or another. And that's true. You could have just chosen the 19th century or pre-19th century. We didn't come to it with any existing definition. Um, but we are choosing one. The relativistic convention is to choose the phi so that it has dimension one. That's it. If we had chosen it to have some other dimension, I could have given it an extra term, m, here. If phi has dimension one, pi has dimension two then this is pi squared over 2 is already got the right dimensions of energy density. If I change that definition of normalization of phi, then I could have put some extra factor here and said C is the analog of M. So, so that was what's being set to 1. And um, you may recall historically uh, the electromagnetic field, of course, came out of experiments, and so it came with a set of units attached. And you may recall that it comes with things like epsilon and mu and all of those things which I've long since forgotten. Um, 
precisely because we do away with those relativistically, right? When we set the speed of light equals to one, we set those two things equal to one, and, and, and so our electromagnetic field, the, 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 the electromagnetic potential has different units to people in this class than to people outside because of this. Um, so that's more like what we do. So it is, it is a choice, but it's like setting c equals to one. Right? It's like setting c equals yeah. to one, or epsilon equals one, or right, whatever right. that is, permittivity, permittivity, whatever. Right. We don't even care. <laughs> so, um, so, okay, so, so that's the end. So you see, there are enough things to get confused about that you just have to remind yourself to be careful. That is, don't just jump into it completely. Uh, that is really more like a harmonic oscillator. Uh, and these analogies are very, very powerful. Time and time again, you get confused here, and you say, ah, but there's a toy model. And, and I'm going to go back to that. You know, I've been doing cosmology, quantum cosmology, and this kind of game uh, with one of the postdocs. And when you get really confused, it's funny because here it's very abstract. And oddly enough, here it's just instinctive enough that it's almost like some other part of your intuition kicks in. And you would often guess answers and then try to prove them in here. Um, so it's, it's not a small thing that I'm giving you here. Um, Yes, I was pointing here and saying, well, you know, because I've gone and pulled the potential term out, which I didn't have to do, I could have just said the potential that this, normally you'd say the potential includes the mass term. So if you want, let me just stick to the standard notation and put it in there, get rid of it there. And, uh, but it still is there. Um, so here, too, I will just drop it in that spirit that it is sitting in there. And, uh, and this is nothing but d mu phi squared. So read it two ways. In the first line, all I'm doing is copying non-relativistic quantum mechanics. You're supposed to put m x dot squared over 2. Well, then m is 1 in this analogy. x dot squared is what I've written. Over. So I've written the x dot squared. Then I have to write minus the potential. Well, the potential is the field theory potential, but it's also this gradient term. So I have to subtract that, so it gets subtracted. But then this and this combine into this beautiful Lorentz invariant structure, d mu phi squared. Okay. But you can just think of it as just, this is just the non-relativistic quantum mechanics version, where x is just an index that I'm summing over so for example, when I wrote phi dot squared, when you write something like integral d cubed x phi dot squared over 2, this is exactly like somebody writing sum over j equals 1 to n, um, x j dot, so this of course depends on x, depends on t. It's like somebody writing that except for m equals 1. Okay. So it, it, it reads as perfect non-relativistic quantum mechanics in a space where the fields are the coordinates. And it reads like perfect relativistic field theory, where you just have integral d4x, beautiful Lorentz invariant measure, d mu phi squared, another beautiful Lorentz invariant integrand and a potential that if there was no source breaking Lorentz invariance explicitly by my experimental equipment, if I threw that away, then the potential term is also Lorentz invariant because phi is the scale. Okay. So okay. 
So it looks very nice, whatever it is, but what, what question are we actually, um, what question are we answering? Here's the question. And what it's saying is, this goes from T i to T phi. It's saying, this is the amplitude that a field It's exactly the analog of non relativistic quantum mechanics. You tell me, this is a C number. I stress, this is a, a C number. Just like this, this is a C number. You're just telling me what the initial position is. I'm telling you what the initial field looks like. And I mean, it's just some, it's like telling you some classical field. Okay? And you go to some other field at time tf. So examples are things like phi initial of x is equal to sine x cos y tan z. This is a, this is how C number, I mean the field to be. There are no operators hiding here. I could stipulate that at time zero seconds, I have a field that looks this way. As I said, there's a beautiful answer here, and it's just the, the question is a bit confusing given how we have so far learned quantum field theory. So we need to backtrack a little and make contact with what, how this pattern rule is answering equivalent <laughs> questions. Fields, you can sort of see them doing things and x and y and z. And this is some other field, and we're saying, I know 100% that at time t initial, I have a field, very classically, and it's doing this. And I want to know that at time t final, what are the amp uh, the, what are the chances, what's the amplitude that it is doing this? Okay, that's that's what we're saying. It's that basic. Now, this is not the way we're used to thinking about quantum field theory. That is, we're used to thinking about particles and S matrix and this, that, and the other. Um, but this is the way we are used to thinking about non-relativistic quantum mechanics. We're used to it non-relativistic, and, and, and I mean this in two ways, in the analog way and, and the way that you could get confused about. It. So, because of, you know. So, we are used to thinking of wave functions, so in quantum mechanics, we are used to thinking of wave functions as being functions of x that could be sine x, cos y, tan z. That is absolutely not the right analogy to be making with these guys. That's not who these guys are. And it's terrible because there are certain circumstances in which This can be a reflection of this. But in general, they are completely different species. They're not, they're, they're, neither are they the same, and neither are they analogies of each other. It's not correct on just one side, 
it, there's no way you're supposed to confuse them, except it is kind of confusing. And occasionally, people, the history of the subject seems to have this word, second quantization. And in second quantization, things that look like this from first quantization, you know, the first quantization you ever learned, turn into things about field theory. And so it's, it's a little bit muddled. So I'm going to belabor the difference just a little bit <coughs> to say, so this is bad. Don't think like this. It's not a wave function. You should not think of this as a wave function. You should think of it exactly like you think of this. That's not a wave function. It's just saying, I know where I am at time initial. 100%, I'm in this eigenstate of being exactly at position x initially. And, and, and that's what you're supposed to think of this as. And, and now I just want to compare with the usual language of Fox space which is how you've been doing field theory up to now, and what things like this actually mean. Okay, so. So. How are these related to standard QFT so in a sense you last saw these if you learn field theory as let's do classical field theory like thinking about electromagnetic field theory Maxwell fields and then you think of scalar fields as just being similar to Maxwell fields, except simpler. And then you say, let's quantize the theory. That was the last time you ever saw things that looked like this. But this quantize the theory was such a discrete move, I mean, a revolutionary move, that then you lost track of where these had gone after that point. <coughs> um, so, but, but they're back. Um, so this is a mild digression, I think necessary if you know what you're doing, but mild digression from the main track of path and rule. Uh, so, so we can compare with the simple harmonic oscillator. Okay. Again, this quantum mechanics analogy. So this is the direction we call x. This is, of course, energy up here. This is the potential. And uh, this is the ground state. And so we usually call this this, this. But there's a, and, and, and the typical wave function so for example, this ground state, this is actually the energy I've drawn, the energy level, which is what I've illustrated. This is the ground state energy, this is the energy of the first excited state. But I should probably draw um, the way, what the wave functions look like. And so maybe I'll do that here. Um, this wave function looks like some Gaussian. And everything else looks wrinkly. Okay. Um, now, uh, sorry. Slide again. But there's another very special type of wave function, and that's the one that looks like this. think of as the wave function
this is the wave function which says, I am absolutely sure that my particle, the, the non-relativistic particle of the harmonic oscillator, I'm absolutely sure that I'm living at x bar. I didn't say it's an energy eigenstate. I just said it's a wave function. Right? It's not a time-independent wave function. It's just a wave function. But it is a wave function, and, and that's what it looks like. So basically that's that. Okay? Um, of course, this is a complete basis, the energy eigenstates. So for example, something like this is a superposition of things that look like this. Well, the heck of a lot of these in the call. But something like this can be written like this. So even in harmonic oscillators, very quickly the harmonic oscillator algebra becomes so efficient to you that you start thinking in terms of this language. Forget field theory, just one again. Harmonic oscillators, you start thinking of this language. <coughs> you may forget occasionally that all of these things that we're drawing formally like this actually are wave functions that look like this. And the whole game, you can say it's about occupation number. But the other equivalent way of saying it is, no, it's about how things move in space. And the quantum mechanics of moving around in space, the thing that drove the whole story in the first place. And that one can always start with an, any initial wave function you want. If you want to know about dynamics, you are not obliged to say, I start in state 2, and I want to know the amplitude to go to state 3. If I have some perturbation to this Hamiltonian, maybe it looks a little anharmonic, this oscillator, then there'll be some amplitude to go from state 2 to state 3. You're not obliged to ask that question. You could ask, I start in an initial wave function that looks like this. Now it's not a solution to the time-independent Schrodinger equation. <coughs> these are. These are not. So at some time later, it's going to look different. And I could ask, for example, I could, I could say, If I start at some initial time with this wave function, what is the amplitude to end up at time tf with this wave function? I could ask that question. It's not as easy as asking questions about this, but it is equivalent to knowing the harmonic oscillator. Okay. You can always do it efficiently. You can take the